We need millions of dollars, and we are a big enough church to bring that. We, you, must all give soon enough to make a difference in taking the gospel to the world. Take a look at what you have. Gold, silver, 401ks, stocks, coins, stamps, paintings, antiques, equity. What do you have that you don't need? The voice that you just heard belongs to Dave Pack, the leader of the Restored Church of God, which is today located in Wadsworth, Ohio. Pack started this church in 1999 as essentially an offshoot of an offshoot of the Worldwide Church of God. And like the WCG, Restored has a focus on end-time prophecy. Unlike Herbert Armstrong, Pack seems to have an almost obsession with date setting. In fact, Pack has been delivering a prophetic sermon series, which is now in something like part 360, where he tells members that the end times will begin on a particular day, only to have to revise that date when it doesn't come to pass. From 13 Media, I'm Trisha Jenkins, and this is Worldwide, the Unchosen Church. As the opening clip also illustrates, the RCG asks its members for money frequently, and for a lot of it. But while Dave Pack is an important figure in this episode, it's actually not about him. This episode is really about Dave's son-in-law, Kevin Denis, who, like a lot of people on this podcast, was born into the WCG. Only he then joined an offshoot church that retained Armstrongism after it went more mainstream evangelical. Along the way, Kevin married Dave Pack's daughter, Jennifer, which helps explain why Kevin and his parents, and even his siblings, all followed Dave when he decided to start his own church. And for the next 15 years, Kevin, his wife, his in-laws, his siblings, his parents, his children, and even his job all belonged to the restored Church of God. Kevin quickly rose through its ranks, becoming its executive director of operations and was even its director of church administration for a while. But then, in 2016, Kevin and his wife did something unprecedented. They became the first high-ranking members of the church to leave In a move that surprised nearly everyone, they resigned from the board, quit their church administration jobs, and they even severed their ties with their own father and father-in-law. Now, six years later, Kevin is finally ready to publicly tell the story of why he left the doomsday cult that his father-in-law built, and how he hopes that telling his story will help other members of the RCG and high-demand religious groups like it to get out. So the Restored Church of God is what many describe as a splinter group of the Worldwide Church of God. And that was formed essentially by one minister, Dave Pack, my father-in-law, in 1999. They set out from early on to essentially be the same thing as the Worldwide Church of God when it was on track. If you want it all back again, you can have it exactly as Mr. Armstrong had it. This is who we are. We are the continuation. Trying to set themselves apart from all the other churches of God. Yeah, if you want the more liberal ones, or if you want to, you know, be less spiritual, and in some cases not even have God's spirit, you can go to those churches of God. But if you want the real deal, you come to us. That was the prevailing thinking. And so there's, there's a bunch of literature on the website that forms this foundation, forms this facade, this digital presence of, of this is exactly like the Worldwide Church of God. So after Kevin told me that, I actually went to the Restored Church of God's website. And I did notice that they offer several pieces of literature for free digital download that are essentially like knockoffs of Armstrong's original booklets. It's just that the RCG can't offer Armstrong's original literature because they don't own the copyright to it. Pack also has a telecast that he calls The The World World to Come, Come, which he puts up on YouTube and matches the style and setting and content of Armstrong's own broadcast called The The World World Tomorrow. Tomorrow. 
And in the About section of the RCG website, it's clear the PAC has worked to recreate the Worldwide Church of God's original campus headquarters in Pasadena, California, through the development of his own 100-acre campus in Ohio. There's this strange kind of ancillary obsession to kind of have the olden days of the Worldwide Church of God back again. The actual layout of the Restored Church of God campus was designed in a way to mimic and mirror where the Ambassador Auditorium was and where the Hall of Administration was. They have both purchased homes on the campus and they have built homes on the campus. And the built homes, that whole area is called, I think they call it Faculty Way. So again, it goes back to that Pasadena campus concept of there being an area where the senior men, so to speak, could live. That's all been done and done for years. It's very well manicured. More recently, they acquired horses and, and they built a little horse farm. And now essentially you have this campus. And, and, he, and he, he talks about, he said it in sermons, like he almost never leaves. That's, this has become his little physical kingdom, if you will. I kind of put that in quotes. And there are paved pathways everywhere. There are beautiful trees everywhere. There are pole barns. There, there's just a vast expanse of, of what has kind of developed. But if Dave Pack has tried to recreate the glory days of the Worldwide Church of God in Ohio, Kevin says his father-in-law is like Armstrong, but now on steroids. In 2003, Pack declared that he was God's new modern-day apostle, and, of course, the leader of God's one true church. And many years later, he also came to preach that he was the Elijah, someone he believed would lead the two witnesses at the end times arrival that are prophesied about in Revelation 11. While the WCG and other churches of God have always had a council of elders, Kevin says that PAC is really just a one-man show and that it's the RCG's lack of a governing advisory council who has the power to remove a leader when necessary that appears to fuel some of PAC's more bizarre self-perceptions and seems to have let him run away with an almost zealot-like focus on doomsday apocalyptic date setting. Staggering events will soon shock the whole world. Unrest grows daily around the world. Terrorism is mounting, and bad news increases while good news is scarce. Conditions worsen almost daily. Human decadence and immorality, poverty, famine, disease, ethnic rivalries, crime, and violence are exploding. Where are these trends leading? Will human life survive? I think when there is an individual that has a very autocratic one man, one person control, that there becomes an unfettering of, of your mind in the sense of you begin to grow in importance and you begin to look for scenarios in the Bible that fit your biases. So like in this case, it was early on 2003, he felt he became an apostle, and then over time, even though he taught for years that Mr. Armstrong was the Elijah, he then determined he was the Elijah. And when you do that, and you so desperately want these things to come to pass, and you're unfettered, and you don't have, in this case, a lot of people to protect you, you essentially have the ability to fly away with yourself and... and ultimately dream up these prophetic schemes that apparently are intoxicating. When you focus on being the one man in charge, and when you start to see yourself in Bible prophecy as a specific profile, even if you try and say you're trying to stay humble, to kind of see yourself in the pages of the Bible becomes... I don't know, a very interesting scenario because it's like, 
wow, you know, this could be me. And he's talked about that in various instances in this long sermon series of like what his role will be. So Kevin says that Pack's extreme focus on date setting actually started back in 2012, where he became focused on an obscure scripture in the Bible that described three shepherds being cut off in one month. The church's leaders under Pack's direction then spent months analyzing the scripture, trying to figure out who the shepherds were. And eventually, they sort of concluded that they were figures from rival Church of God splinter groups, and that once God had cut them off, then his real work could begin, and the tribulation would start. But even back in 2007, Kevin says that Pack was already focused on end-time prophecy and was dabbling in end-time math. In 2007, essentially a series of sermons were given that had a prophetic logic to them that essentially went like this. Mankind has 6,000 years of time before the 1,000 years of millennium occurs. And so that was kind of a general teaching that Herbert Armstrong taught. That was, that's not necessarily new. But what happened, this house of cards was built off of kind of that concept. And so if, if there are 6,000 years, could we perhaps look at all of the history of mankind and determine where we are in those 6,000 years? That seems like a logical question, right? So that happened and through the course of these sermons where you study the genealogies and kind of total everything up in the Bible and you can get to a figure to where we are today to Jesus's time and so forth you can get to a figure around 6,000 years now there's some kind of assumptions in your math you can't know it exactly there's the timing of Solomon's temple blah 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 again don't want to get off into the weeds but the point is the whole core of that sermon was essentially, and this was given again in 2007, the whole core of that theology was there's no way, since we only have 6,000 years, no matter your assumptions, the worst case scenario or the farthest timeline we could go is 2021. So that's when Jesus would return. So subtract three and a half years for what we thought would be the tribulation. Essentially, you're at, what, 2016-ish? So you're hearing that you have upwards of, you know, could be a few years, could be nine years. And, and the sermons literally say that, you know, we could have a few, we could have, you know, eight or nine years. And that declaration in 2007, that the three-year tribulation would start at the latest in 2016 or 2017, had a profound effect on Pack's teachings about financial giving, which Kevin describes again as like Armstrongism, but on steroids. So for background, Armstrong used to demand that church members give 10% of their income every year directly to the church. He also required that members save another 10% of their money to fund their travels to a week-long festival called the Feast of Tabernacles. And every three years, members also had to give an additional 10% of their money to the widows and the poor, which again was a tithe administered by the church. Now, if you're feeling broke just listening to that, I totally get it. But Kevin explains this on an even deeper level to show you how Restored went even beyond what Armstrongism demanded from its members financially. Now, the focus on money is something that is a part of the Worldwide Church of God and even more so the Restored Church of God. So we have things like the first tithe, which is 10%. Now that even that, I would put a little asterisk there, is that can be also more if it's gross or net. So that I think the church got to a point where they accepted the net but some of the churches of God to this day say, no, you have to tithe on the gross. And anybody who does math or knows their budget and knows their taxes, 10% on your gross versus 10% on your net is a whole different ballgame, right? Let alone if you're in a country with a higher tax rate like Canada or Western Europe and so forth. So the church has first tithe. It has second tithe, which is 10% for the annual feast days. 
which ironically, the church also developed a tithe of tithe there where 10% of that second tithe goes to the church to run the feast. So technically you're only doing 9% for your feast and then 1% goes to the church to run the feast site. Then you have the third tithe, which every three to four years you are supposed to give another 10%. And so that's kind of the baseline for Church of God Christianity, which tithing is not necessarily an obscure concept. Other Christian groups tithe. I'm not aware of any that require 20 to 30 percent kind of out of the gate. But there was also a focus on offerings. So if you want to really get literal, there are tithes and offerings. So, hey, give us all these 10 percenters. And then on top of that, you should be giving offerings. And then on top of all of that, you should give Holy Day offerings. So there are seven Holy Days through the year. So you need to give more in addition to your tithes and offerings. You have your Holy Day offerings. So you can see the baseline here is already pretty extreme. And on top of that, there were focuses on, back in the olden days, people leaving money uh, to the church in in their will or leaving their houses and so forth. So that's the record of history going back decades. And that theme and focus on money has kind of continued, but again, it's now on steroids. So that whole focus that I described, that whole baseline is absolutely there. But it, from day one almost, in the Restored Church of God, it became more of a focus. There were things like building funds that were instituted. So when there were like specific projects that we wanted to do, there would be an additional, let's give for that. Essentially like a a giving campaign, a building campaign, it certainly happens, but it was on top of everything. Kevin says that Pack's focus on finances got even more severe when he gave what is now called the Clarion Call Sermon, in which Pack states that members should give almost everything they have to the church. The Clarion Call, he says... It's an infamous or famous sermon in the Restored Church of God that essentially encouraged people to give more, to give essentially any extra, and any extra in terms of if you have equity in your home, if you have 401ks, if you have paintings on the walls, anything that's extra, give it. Give it to the work because, hey, we only have four, five, six, seven, eight, nine years left. And so we didn't officially then, Dave didn't name a date, but gave this kind of range of, you know, we only have a certain number of years. So, and and even when it came to the will, like why would you leave, why would you leave money in your will to your children when you know this is all going to end soon? So huge drumbeat by that point forward of giving more. And then what happened a few years later, there was essentially the, the, the term all things common is a term that's found in the Bible. But the interpretation that Dave Pack took was that you essentially the church and therefore the leader being him has the ability to determine that all things common is a doctrine it now became a doctrine of the church. So before, in 2007, it wasn't a quote-unquote doctrine. It was a more a prophetic logic of we don't have a lot of time, why not give? Now, he upped the ante and said essentially this is doctrine, and this was doctrine in the New Testament, and it's doctrine again, and you need to sell all and give to the church. These are a few edited clips from that All Things Common sermon. At the resurrection of the dead, you realize not one person there will own land or a house. Not one living Christian in God's church will still have a land or a house. As a matter of fact, we will have decided three years and eight and a half months earlier to leave our houses and our lands. You're going to have to leave your dwelling, your house. You're going to have to give it up. So the question is, will you give it up earlier? Take a look at what you have. Gold, silver, 401ks, stocks, coins, stamps, paintings, antiques, equity. What do you have that you don't need? 
Continue your lifestyle. Don't leave yourself with no clothes standing out in an intersection without food in your stomach or a house. There are ways to do this and you may need counsel. But there are a lot of things you can get rid of. If you want to give, call us with a number and an approximate date. Mr. Armstrong once asked the church to go out and borrow money and then repay it and give it back. Some of you may want to do that. You may want to go borrow money knowing that you can pay it back. That's fine. We are absolutely on a time crunch to get into people's lives with the truth of the kingdom of God. When people come to talk to our ministers now, our ministers are not going to tell them, go slow, think about it. Don't No, this is a doctrine. This is a command of God. This is what Jesus Christ said. I will close by announcing superfunding has come. Good night. I asked Kevin why PAC wanted members' money. I mean, if the end times was near, what exactly was he going to do with it? And what was the work going to look like? Kevin said that essentially the church claimed that the money was needed to spread the gospel through the publications of booklets or videos like those in the World to Come series. And that did and does continue to recur. What's more interesting, though, is that if you look at where the money actually goes, Kevin said it's really towards the building projects on the campus, a move which Pack has justified with the somewhat curious teaching that says, Restored's 100-acre campus in Wadsworth, Ohio, is somehow going to serve as a part of God's headquarters when his kingdom is established on earth. Kevin says that the church's All Things Common sermon is one of the major reasons that he and his wife finally started to question the restored Church of God and eventually leave it. The practices that Dave Pack was preaching regarding money just seemed immoral or unethical. But it wasn't the only thing that made them leave. In 2013, Kevin's father-in-law started making predictions about when the end times would start. And when those dates passed and proved false, he'd quickly explain why he had been mistaken or confused, and then he'd make another prediction, which would again fail. And that cycle of prediction and failure and revised prediction and failure is still going on today, in 2022. That's a a glaring red flag when you miss a quote-unquote prophetic date. Even the Bible says you're false. So... Why are people still there? But they are. And and it doesn't necessarily shake them, which is hard for me to comprehend now because in the case of the restored Church of God, it happens, and I don't mean to say this kind of lightheartedly, it happens now almost like every other week. Like this is, we're talking here in the middle of the spring holy days uh, for them. So we just came upon Passover, and then after that, the night to be much observed, And even in the last week, there was like several indications in sermons that this is it. It's happening. Prior to that, it was Abib 1, which is the beginning of the Hebrew month that we're currently in. And again, I I can go off into a lot of details there. But the point is, they're like failed dates are, are occurring regularly and a lot of people stay. You can even hear in this next clip, Pac suggesting in a 2022 sermon, that the tribulation is going to start in like eight and a half days. And he tells members that they better sell all if they want to be on the right side of eternity. There are no questions right down to the day all of this happens. We were never going to see until we got to the end of the series and God wanted the mystery that Paul explained to the Colossians and the Ephesians and so forth. He wanted that mystery understood. So I'm going to tell you, be ready. We're going to talk on Sabbath, if you haven't sold all, I counsel you to do it. We may have some among us. If you don't think this is God's church, get straightened out right now or maybe move on and face your eternity one way or the other down a different path. But I'm just going to say with, with the, what, eight and a half days to go, meet God's checklist. I'll see you Sabbath. To me, setting dates that can only fail seems like kind of a rookie cult leader mistake. Even Herbert Armstrong, who once predicted that the tribulation would start in 1972, learned his lesson. When that date came and passed, 
and a lot of members got upset and left the church. After that, he never made a specific date prediction again. Instead, he just used language about the end times that included phrases like, in the next couple of years, or soon, or in the next decade, or in our lifetime. And after Pack's specific failed prophecy dates, members of the restored Church of God have absolutely left. But the church hasn't folded. It actually continues to gain new members. And Kevin thinks that it has something to do with YouTube and Google. So my interpretation of the last century was the Worldwide Church of God was pretty good at getting out ahead of technology. They first were called the Radio Church of God. They had a TV program. They had a big magazine distribution. And so they weren't the only ones doing it by any stretch of the imagination, but they were good at, and frankly, Armstrong even said this, he was an advertising man. So he kind of knew on some level how to get the word out, right? How to sell, in this case, religion, but you know, they, we wouldn't see it like that. So the Restored Church of God, in a similar fashion, was, relatively speaking, cutting edge in their view of technology. So, for instance, things like websites. The Restored Church of God's websites have always been, essentially, not as much now anymore, but 5, 10, 15 years ago, were better than the other churches of God. The Restored Church of God also was able to jump into Google advertising and different online ads before other churches of God did. So they were kind of ahead of the curve there. Also, the Restored Church of God jumped into the TV, not only reproducing what was kind of of the past with the World Tomorrow program, but also really focusing on getting it on YouTube and kind of getting the reach out there. And then that ultimately led to a focus on social media too. And so... If you focus on new medium enough, what happens after a while is a certain amount of momentum. So I think like soon before we left in 2016, they had 100,000 YouTube subscribers. They're approaching 200,000 now. Not insignificant. I haven't compared them to the other churches of God, but I'm guessing they're probably ahead of others. And some of their videos are actually up into, into the millions of views. And so it almost takes a life of its own. And that generates the, the front of the funnel. If you look at it from a sales perspective, they'll have a certain public view, and then you're going to learn more of the, the more questionable doctrines and teachings and ways of life once you're kind of hooked into the group. And then so what happens is you're going to have people peel off. And having left in 2016, I've talked with tons of people, dozens and dozens of people, perhaps hundreds of people that have left um, because when you see the fruits of it, not if you claim you're the true church and claim you're this, that, and the other, and then there's just flat out like false prophecies, that does become problematic for thankfully some who end up leaving. But yet it gets backfilled with new recruits, if you will. Kevin says that Pack's all things common doctrine and his continued failed prophecies are eventually what led he and his wife out of the church. But when your whole family are still members, when your father and father-in-law is the leader, and when your job is within the church, that decision to leave is full of trepidation and fear. The story of us leaving is an interesting one. Obviously, I was relatively speaking, quote unquote, a high ranking uh, person in the church, which again, I look back now and I'm, I'm, I'm sick just thinking about it. But we left in June of 2016, June 17th, that day I obviously will never forget because it completely changed our lives. And it was one of the most special days of my life too, because it was just transformative in the sense of it gave myself and my wife, Jennifer, who is the daughter of the leader an opportunity to start over. There was certainly a lot of fear in the sense of like what was going to happen. What were they going to do to us? We had three young boys. What were they going to do to them potentially? How were they going to divide our marriage? There was just a lot of questions and fears that we had because it never had really happened on the restored church of God where somebody of high stature just left. But 
we got to a point of that we had no other choice. This was wrong. This is not, we do not believe this anymore. We do not want to teach our children this. And it was truly an awakening, like the scales came off. We had reset on our church, in our belief system, on our family, because a lot of our family was there, on our jobs slash careers, on our friends. It was a very close knit, I would say, incorrectly so, uh, organization. So everything was kind of behind those gates. Kevin says that he and his wife planned their departure from the church like it was their D-Day. He joked that he wished he had had the guts to resign and denounce the church very publicly in a sermon given from the pulpit. But instead, they chose to write an extensive letter to Dave Pack, outlining why they were leaving. They officially resigned from the church's corporate board, and while they never worried about Pack or church leaders retaliating against them with violence, they did fear that Pack might try to divide their marriage or seek legal retaliation for a breach of contract or maybe for disclosing confidential information. None of those things, thankfully, ever came to pass. What did come to pass is that Kevin and his wife spent the next six years figuring out how to heal from their time in the church and the anger that they felt in having stayed in it for so long. Part of that process involved research and study. After leaving, we did more research, more understanding of the nature of the group, even though we knew by that point how wrong it was. We did more study. We studied the concept of, of I know it's a, a big bad word, but like what is a cult and what makes a cult? And, we did the research after we left and like and went to experts and learned about how like there's a, a model out there by a cult expert his name is Steve Hassan who has similarly studied the churches of God talks about this bite model and how there's different levels of thought control and behavior control and all these things and so we studied a lot of that after so as we hit reset Beginning to rebuild our life, we also began to learn and understand more of, of where we were. And, and just the clarity continued to happen. Kevin says that neither he nor his wife had a relationship with their father and father-in-law anymore. He didn't really want to say too much about that, except to say that it was really just not in their best interest and that it was surreal to now realize with some distance and perspective that his father-in-law literally believes he is God's apostle and is prophesied about in the Bible. What Kevin most wants now is to tell a story in the hopes that it will help others that are still inside of the Restored Church of God or in any high-demand religious group that's like it. When you process yourself out of a group like this, you're on a journey. I know many dozens of people who have left the Restored Church of God. We, we reminisce, we cry, we go through like our own therapy with each other. It's a process. It's not easy. There were times early on after 2016 where, you know, when you leave a group like this that was your whole life, you, you get waves of depression and, and, and just you're circling through a lot of emotions. Some people leave and want nothing to do with it. It's just a terrible chapter in their life and they have to move on. Makes sense. Perfectly acceptable. And then there are other people that maybe don't have that approach in the sense that maybe they want to help in some way or serve in some way. You know, like in some respects, and this is true of any organization, there's a lot of good people over there. There are good, sincere people there, just like there are in any other organization, good, bad, or ugly. And so I find myself six years later, you know, why am I talking about this now? I've talked a lot about it privately to lots of people, but yet at the same time, the ability to speak about it in a more public way is perhaps an example of where I am on that journey. And frankly, that one of the driving motivations is helping others see this. It's hard when you're in there to see it, but I still have family members there. I have a, a brother, sister-in-law, 
a nephew and two nieces that are still there. So just on a human kind of core familial perspective, I have that motivation behind me. But then the bigger picture, some people don't talk about these experiences after, and I think that's bad. Not in the sense that I I think it's acceptable in their cases, but if we all don't talk about it, that's not good. And so talking about them and educating and learning and understanding how these things occurred and what occurred could help others and will help others. So that in the biggest sense is why I am doing this because people continue to be deceived or continue to be kind of stuck in this, in a controlled mindset where they can't see clearly. Hello, you just, you had uh, hundreds of false prophecies in the last six years. Why would you stay? They, that's logic. And it's so strange to say there are good, smart people that can't see logic. So perhaps and hopefully unvarnished perspective on how, how you can come out. And frankly, there's hope on the other side too, because that's, that's one thing when you are in places like this, you're kind of hopeless at times. You don't know, you feel, and I've heard people say this. I've heard people who are still over there say it. Where else can I go? There's nowhere else to go. You, on some level, believe you have to stay there. And you're also conditioned on this kind of bizarre spiritual way that if you leave, you're going to be punished. Or, you know, to take it to the nth degree, Satan is going to punish you in some way. And the pattern of prophecy and money, kind of those two main ingredients in the cocktail, are alive and well. And they're causing damage to people. Like, that, that's the, I, I want to give a message of hope, but the, there's also a message of, you know, there are real people giving real amounts of money that are causing permanent consequences in their life. Like, if you or I, you know, took our 401k or, and just gave it all away, you can't undo that. That, that. That's a fork in the road you'll never get back. And so I think as a society, we need to continue to be aware of that and try and help in the ways that we can. And the reality is, there is life thereafter and there is a future. And as scary as it is, the point is that you can move on. It's, it's something that I want others to know. And to know, frankly, we're just in a, a moment in time that others will be helped in the future is, is a pretty cool thing. I agree that sharing the stories of life inside of a high-demand religious group is incredibly important. And it's one of the reasons that I ever started this podcast in the first place. And I'm so thankful that Kevin trusted me to tell his story. If you'd like to read some of the books that Kevin says were particularly helpful in his transitioning out of the Restored Church of God, he says to check out Dr. Stephen Hassan's book, Combating Cult Mind Control and Freedom of Mind. He also recommends Leah Remini's documentary series called Scientology and the Aftermath, which he says, even though it's about a different organization, shows tremendous parallels to his experience in the restored Church of God. Next up on Worldwide, the Unchosen Church. There is no other human being on the planet who has a more central place in the chess world than Bobby Fischer. He was the Muhammad Ali of chess. He was the Michael Jackson of chess. He was the one who captured the imagination of the world. I tried to apply when I learned in the church for my chess career too. But I still, you know, was studying chess. I wasn't, you know, just trusting in God to give me the moves, you know. We're going to shake things up a bit next week by doing a historical look at the most famous person to ever be a member of the Worldwide Church of God, world chess champion Bobby Fischer. We're going to play never-before-made-public taped interviews between Bobby and the editorial team of the Ambassador Report. Before closing out today, I'd like to extend a very heartfelt thank you to Kevin Denis for sharing his story today about his time and exodus from the restored Church of God. Worldwide, The Unchosen Church is written, produced, and hosted by me, Trisha Jenkins. Music in this episode was licensed by Soundstripe, 
and 13 Media continues to be responsible for all of the amazing sound effects and scoring that you hear throughout these episodes. If you would like to send us a question or a comment, please reach out via email at worldwidepod11 at gmail.com or DM us on social media. You can find us on Instagram at worldwidepod and on Twitter and Facebook at worldwidepod11. Until next week, we hope you can stay out of the heat so that you don't become like the deer who panteth for the water. Worldwide, the Unchosen Church is also proud to support the hashtag I Got Out movement, which empowers survivors of cults and other high demand groups to share their stories online as a catalyst for education, prevention, and healing. Learn how you can share your story and support other survivors at igotout.org.